somebody who's a critically acclaimed author, he's a writer, he's a broadcaster, he's been a fantastic supporter of all of our movements for so many years. Please give a massive welcome to Gary Young. back from the States um, with my kids uh, in the middle of August and it was um, just around the time when Alan Kurdi, the small uh, uh, Syrian boy, was taken from the sea uh, dead and I'd been away for 12 years, I didn't really know what was going on and suddenly seemed to me suddenly this thing happened these people came out and they came out with goods to take to refugees and they organized their own little convoys and, and suddenly I thought wow even though the political class has abandoned the notion of humanity for refugees and immigrants in general there is a constituency here, orphaned by mainstream politics, but that's still been there the whole time, screaming at the TV, probably, shaking their head and thinking, can this get any worse? That mobilized itself and mobilized others and gave me hope, and I think gave other people hope that they weren't alone, that we, as a country and as people, we're better than this. We are better than this. And I didn't know that you were here. I hoped you were here, but I didn't know you were here. And so it's joyous, really, for me to actually see you and to know what you're going to do tomorrow. Because otherwise I just had to dream that that was possible. I thought, imagine, imagine, say, if King didn't have a dream. Imagine that either he had a five-point plan to kind of get something through Congress and, you know, maybe twist a few arms, or maybe just that he just gave up. Who would have blamed him in 63 in America, given everything that was going on, given that his house had been firebombed, given that some of his comrades had been killed, given the destitution and the degradation that African Americans had, and yet he was able to look over the moment to a better place. And in weeks like this, with the vile rhetoric and the political violence that claimed Joe Cox, there is a despondency and a despair, I think, that people feel. And in those moments, it's important to understand that not only are you not alone in feeling that despair and despondency, but as Roger intimated, not to give in to despair and despondency because we're better than that. King said the arc of history is long, but it bends towards progress. But it doesn't bend by itself. It bends because ordinary working people, men and women, the young and the old, put their shoulder to the wheel and they bend it themselves. But we've got our work cut out. And we've got our work cut out because the framework within which we're working is so hostile that we are governed by what I call the golden rule, and that's that those that have the gold make the rules. <laughs> and according to this golden rule, capital can move wherever it wants. It can span the globe in search of labor that's cheaper and unions that are weaker, and nobody stops capital at the border and says, whose job are you gonna take? What devastation are you going to cause? 
But human beings don't have the same rights as machines or money. If I'd wanted to move a million pounds, which I don't have, a million pounds to France today, I could have done it. But if you want to go to France tomorrow and bring aid and comfort to poor people who are destitute, fleeing war, they're going to stop you at the border. That is the system that we are working against. And it produces these awful paradoxes because refugees don't come from nowhere. In no small part, they come from the economic policies that our government and other governments pursue and the foreign policies that our governments and other governments pursue. That if a country elects, democratically elects a leadership that decides it's going to stand four square against poverty and four pensions and four workers' rights, then the invisible hand of the market will grab that leadership by the neck and shake it until it gives up. Look at Greece. That there is no democracy in a world where basically whatever you vote for, capital gets in. And so, a large number of people are fleeing economic policies created by the World Trade Organization or the European Union or, or, or the Eurozone or whoever it is, many of which we are a part of and many of which, many of those uh, uh, policies we advocate. But that's not all. They're also fleeing wars, illegal wars that we started, that created havoc and mayhem, that decimated whole countries and forced people to flee. ISIS did not come away from no from did not come from nowhere. ISIS was created by our war. We made that problem. And so when people say as they do and sometimes they're well meaning they just don't know the facts well we can't take in all the world's misery then at first at least they have to accept that we, in no small part, help create that misery. That the people, many of the people who want to come here, need to come here precisely because we insisted on going there. We are part of the problem and therefore we must be part of the solution. There is no conversation. There is no conversation that you can have about immigration or asylum that doesn't involve or acknowledge war, development, climate change and labour regulation, all of which we have a great deal of control over. But even as we export this economic and military madness, at home we have challenges which also poison the debate because the domestic consequence of that system was a massive crash in 2008. And the bankers bought themselves out of that crisis by making the workers pay. They gambled our money and then forced us to foot the bill. And then the Tories decided to blame immigrants for the problem. But it's not the Roma who traded in credit default swaps. It's not the Syrian refugees who are responsible for closing our libraries and our youth services. It's not working class Muslims who are slashing invalidity benefit. The sponges aren't the people who are risking their lives on rickety boats, hanging under trains, hiding in airplanes and so on and so forth so they can get here and then if if they're lucky, if they're lucky, get some of the meagre benefits that might be offered. They're not the sponges, and the sponges are the bankers who crashed the economy and are now breaking back balances, have to be bailed out to billions and billions of pounds And that's what makes this latest turn 
in the Brexit debate so perverse, whichever side you're on, that the leaders, the most prominent people in the Leave campaign, the Tory right, the very people who are slashing resources and then diverting what's left from the poor to the rich are the very ones saying that the, the immigrants are stealing your resources. They're pissing on our leg, telling us it's raining, and they're blaming immigrants for the weather. We can't have that. <laughs> These are also the people, when it comes to asylum seekers and immigrants who like to talk about integration, about what a challenge it must be, about how hard it is and how these people have to learn great British values, the great British values that they extol and that they seem to exemplify that means no charity, no decency and no humanity. But the people who have the real trouble integrating <clears throat> I'm from Syria, or Eritrea, or Ethiopia, or Libya. They're from Eton, and Bullingdon, and Oxford. These are the people who are struggling to change society. These are the people who have no idea how ordinary working people are here. The major obstacle to integration is not the hijab, or the niqab, or the burqa. It's racism, pure and simple. It's not language or culture or religion, it's racism. Sometimes you have to call things for what they are. If it's racist, it's racism. I want to end by saying that this week, more than most weeks that I can remember, we know that words have consequences. If you describe a group of people as cockroaches and vermin, if you portray them as being less than human, then don't be surprised if they're treated as less than human. What was amazing with the Alan Kurdi incident, where I was, as far as I was concerned, it was like the story of metamorphosis, Kafka's metamorphosis, in reverse. That that's what it took to humanize a section of people from the boats, because that will only encourage them. And guess what? They drowned. They drowned and they died. And I said, European racism killed that kid. Were it not for the push against asylum seekers, those boats could have been rescued and those people could have been rescued and your people start to be like, this is outrageous. It's outrageous. I've never heard something so preposterous. He said it's much more complicated than that. And I said it's not. If a boat's sinking and you won't rescue it, it's really not that complicated. If someone's hungry and you won't feed them, it's not that complicated. If someone's not got a house and you won't shelter them, it's not that complicated. It's not that complicated. So what we've seen over the last, certainly few months, is that some people feel they've been given a license to hate. And what this is, what this convoy and this movement is, is a license to love. And it's the most radical form of love because it's a love, it's easy to love your partner or your kids or people that you know, but this is a love for people that we don't know people we may never know, but who we recognize as people. And if they build a 20-foot wall to keep them out, these people will build a 21-foot wall to get in, and I will help them. I will be on the other side to catch them. say we should look after our own and to that I always say to them these are our own these are human beings this is humanity they are our own I claim them we claim them 
They are people in need of help and assistance and solidarity and that's why I'm so delighted that so many of you are going to go tomorrow, come on man. Say it loud and say it clear, refugees are welcome here.